Hi, everyone. I've been um, invited to go ahead and start because I'm told the room is full, so we should just get going. And uh, I know there's a lot of enthusiasm to hear um, Roz Atkins on this subject, so we might as well maximize our time. So um, it'll come as no surprise to you, I am not Vivian Schiller. <laughs> my, my dear friends, unless I've had a face transplant, but that has not happened. Um, my dear friend Vivian Schiller was unable to join us, and so I've stepped in. My name is Indira Lakshmanan. I'm the senior executive editor um, for news and features at National Geographic Media. And um, I'm also a friend of Roz's and was happy to jump in on this because I'm actually a huge fan of his explainers and of the explainer format in general, both for video and in print. At Nat Geo, we actually have seriously leaned into explainers. Um, digital text explainers are a big, big part, um, arguably one of the most important parts of our traffic and it comes through SEO. This is quite different from the explainers that the BBC does and that Roz has made famous. Um, those go and become viral not through SEO, but through social and through organic sharing. Um, so, I mean, a lot of you in this room may be digital newsroom people who are thinking about how you can do your own explainers, whether they're text, video, or whatever format, Instagram, stories, whatever. Um, I think there are a lot of lessons that we can all draw from this. So I am incredibly pleased to introduce um, our speaker, Roz Atkins. Many of you, I'm sure, are in this room and have packed it to the gills because you already know him as one of the most popular presenters on BBC and also the uh, uh, mastermind, if I can use that word, <laughs> of, sure these, put it that way, but. <laughs> of these, with his incredible team, of these um, video explainers about everything from Partygate, um, the Boris Johnson government scandal over um, the prime minister himself and his top officials breaking their own COVID rules um, by having parties at the height of COVID over Christmas. And you may remember the phrase, drinks, nibbles, games. And if you've not watched that video, I definitely encourage you to. It will explain what party gate is if you're not British. Um, Roz has also made popular um, a couple dozen of explainer videos about Ukraine and every element of the conflict there. Um, everything from a video which I myself used to um, help a friend who was buying into a lot of the Russian propaganda about denazification and kept texting me endlessly substack articles he had read and you know he wouldn't like stop during the workday texting me and I was like oh my goodness and then Roz's nine minute video came out explaining okay, who is this small group of Nazis in um, Ukraine? What percentage of the population, what percentage of the military do they actually make up? And how has that small morsel of reality been completely um, you know, picked up and, and, and um, used as propaganda and twisted? Um, and that one video of nine minutes that I made my friend watch, suddenly it was like the scales dropped from his eyes and everything that I could have possibly told him or told him to read or listen to podcasts or read all these long reads, suddenly he was, it was like he was woken up out of a stupor and said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I hadn't realized this. So um, these explainers play a real value. So I want to start out by asking Roz, um, you know, what, did you have a grand plan to make these explainers? Because I've actually read that in a way it was kind of a happy accident due to one of your viewers in Australia. So tell us that story. Thanks, Indira. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm very flattered that so many of you co have come out. Uh, well, I did have a grand plan, and then we started the grand plan by accident. I think that's probably <laughs> the, the best way of putting it. In 2019, in the middle of 2019, my then editor came to me and said, right, your TV show is doing very well, but I wonder if you want to think about what it could become next. And that prompted me to do a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of thinking about what was going well and what wasn't going well with the TV show I had and the different ways it was, its journalism was impacting. And I ended up with a list of problems, really. It's quite a long list of problems, if I'm honest. Um, and these problems were really the, the foundation of these 
explainer product because on that list of problems was here I was doing a TV show that costs a lot of money for the BBC to make. The TV ratings were, were great. The BBC was happy with the TV product. I was happy with the TV product. I think the audiences were too. But our digital imprint was really negligible, despite us wanting it to be much bigger. Clips from our show just weren't doing very well. And it seemed to me, not just for the BBC, but for any organization that's, in, that's investing heavily in broadcast and investing in TV, if you're getting almost no digital impact in return for that investment, given where we are with journalism and the way we all consume information, that's not, that's not, that's not okay. Like you, and you need to have better digital, digital impact. So that was one thing. The second thing was there was a palpable desire, initially from Donald Trump, but then more broadly in politics, for journalists to change the language that they were using to describe what was true and what wasn't true. And it felt to me like the language that we had traditionally used to take on and report on politics in particular was being tested and we needed to find different ways, both tonal and linguistic, to take on the challenges of describing what is true and what isn't true. So that was on my list because I didn't feel I was doing that well enough. The next thing on my list was how we told stories. On TV and on video, we had quite fixed ways of telling stories. And it seemed to me that while for certain traditional TV audiences that was working, I had the evidence that digitally it wasn't. So I thought, okay, well, we need to try and use a different tone, use different storytelling techniques. That wasn't the end of the problem. The, there was also a problem which was the biggest growth area in terms of digital distribution was social, and social is driven by emotion and by opinion. And traditionally, an impartial news organization like the BBC would not use emotion or opinion. We definitely don't use opinion. We still don't. So how does an impartial journalist such as myself or an impartial team like uh, my brilliant colleagues, how do we fit into that? How do we compete in a world where opinion and emotion is driving a lot of consumption? Like, I didn't know how to fit in, but I was aware that how we were trying to fit in wasn't working. My numbers were very poor, so I was thinking about that. And then I was also thinking about the fact that as journalists, we are preoccupied with establishing what's true, but perhaps we weren't as preoccupied with getting that information to people in the form that they want it, in the places that they want it. And so I was very aware that there were lots of, for example, fact-checking operations around the world doing absolutely brilliant and valuable work, but often those fact-checks just weren't being consumed very heavily. They weren't going viral. They weren't having the impact that the people who had put all that hard work into them might have hoped. So I thought, okay, well, how do we, how do, we do that? And so I was kind of putting all of these things together with one last problem, and you may have experienced this. When you're watching a video or reading an article and it doesn't answer the questions you have about the story, you're like, tell me, like I don't understand this part of the story. And so I became obsessed with every time you make something, you make a list of the things that you don't understand or that other people don't understand, and if you haven't checked them all off, you're not serving your audience. And so I became kind of laser focused on making sure that the work we did directly addressed the questions that we could see people had. And then finally, and you can tell it was a long list of problems, but it helped shape what I hope was a good idea. Too often when I was watching TV or video, I wasn't getting enough information per minute. I wasn't getting, I was giving this, this journalism product time and I wasn't getting enough back. And I had a very high impact experience covering um, the general election in the UK in 2017, the one that uh, Theresa May called to try and increase her majority, but didn't go to plan for her. I was down in Cornwall in the southwest of England where I'm from, and I was reporting for the BBC, and on one of the main TV bulletins, not necessarily a BBC one, there was a report about the election in Cornwall. So I was like, great. That's going to be really helpful. I'm going to watch this. It's going to inform my reporting that I do the next day. And this is like one of the most famous news programs in the country. And there's the report. It's three minutes long. It's four minutes long. I was there with my notepad ready to make notes of all the things it was going to tell me. There was hardly anything in it. There was hardly anything in it. And so I, that was a, a moment of clarity where I thought, if I'm going to ask any of you to watch a video for five minutes, I'm going to make sure at the end of that five minutes you're going to get a use, uh, an awful lot of useful information. And I hope, whether you like them or not, you certainly would agree that we're 
we're putting a lot in there. And so part of that was, was adapting the way that we tell stories to make sure that you are giving people a lot in return for their time. And so that's a, a very long list of, of problems that I started to think about. And the idea that came out of all of those problems was essentially a one-stop shop. You create a video product that if you ask someone to watch it, will guide them through the essential information on that issue or story. And that you are not limiting yourself by time. So you're not saying it has to be two minutes or 10 minutes. You're simply asking yourself a more fundamental question. If someone watches this, what do they need to understand the issue or the story? Not what form does it come in, not have we got enough tweets or enough data or enough maps or enough clips or enough stills or all of these different things which you could use. But that's not where we start. We just start with what's the essential information? And on every video we make, the answer to that question will be different. And sometimes we'll need nine minutes and sometimes we'll need two. But I wanted to create a product that was high protein and which you could trust to tell you the essential information on the, on the given story. Because it seemed to me that we were all suffering, all are suffering, from excess information. It's overwhelming. There's a tsunami of information coming at us. And if I could create, with the help of my brilliant colleagues, a product that assisted our audience in navigating these stories, then perhaps it would be popular. Because one thing we were hearing time and time again was, and we still hear it, people are aware of the story. People are aware of the issue. We're not telling them about stories they don't know about. But they're not sure how to judge the story. They're not sure how to judge the vast amount of information that is out there. And so this product is designed to say, we've done this work to help you. And, and I think you were saying about podcasts and, and long reads, but there was, there was one journalist in the UK who was very nice about what we do, and he said, it's like having you know, three long reads and five podcasts condensed into five minutes, but it's still quite consumable. And so that's, a, I guess, what we're trying to do. It's a shortcut for people to say, we will do the work for you and help you through this issue. We're not trying to persuade you this issue is important. You've already decided that. But this is hopefully a product that will, um, that will be there for you. And then, sorry, it's a very long answer, but the, the last thing I would say is, I've kind of made this point before, but I'll make it once more, is that if you are going to go viral, if you're going to, have, if you're going to perform in emotional places where, where, you are, where you are dependent on people sharing and feeling sufficiently enthused by your product that they're actually going to bother to send it to people who they have a connection with, it needs to be really good. And I don't mean that to sound immodest. I just mean that quite often, certainly in the world of TV news, we make a lot of perfectly good journalism. Seven, eight out of 10 journalism. It's factually correct, it's well produced. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not criticizing it. I make a lot of it myself. But what we were noticing is you take that perfectly good journalism and you put it in the social arena, it doesn't do better than if you'd made something that was terrible. They both perform the same. The only things that perform well are exceptional things. And exceptional things are more expensive to make they take more staff, they're harder, but they're the only thing that's worth doing. And one of the things we've really learned is sometimes on a week, we won't make a video. Unless we are convinced we have something exceptional to share, we don't share it. Because on the times when we've shared something that was pretty good, people don't, people don't share it. They want something exceptional. And so one of the tests for these kind of products is Traditionally, exceptional video that goes viral is a one-off event, a remarkable moment in an interview. It goes viral. Something unusual happens when a politician trips over. It goes viral. These are one-off exceptional events. The challenge for all of us as journalists is how do you make exceptional video content systematically rather than waiting for unusual events to come along? Because you can't, you can't know when the unusual event is going to come along. And, and often they're quite rare. So the challenge here is how do you make something exceptional in a systematic way? And that, for me, involved creating a product rather than creating an inclination to do something. It felt to me we needed to be more systematic in how we approached it. I want to get back to that, and especially into the nuts and bolts of imagining the product, having certain benchmarks that you set for the product, making sure that every video you do fills that 
you know, fills that list. But before that, I want to I want to just um, pause for a moment over the word you used, exceptional, and how you said it has to be exceptional, and if it's not, don't do it. I'm just pointing this out because I think that this is an important lesson for all of us, again, with no matter what the medium is. And I say this because I think so much of us in this digital transformation environment um, particularly in legacy media, are thinking about like, you know, we need to drive traffic, we need to have certain numbers, we need to do this. And what we all, I think, discover, again, whether it's a text product, a video product, or whatever, is that you can do lots of stuff, and it, if it doesn't do well, what's the point? Mm -hmm. if it's not breaking through. So it's better to sort of be more selective. And I think for Absolutely. all of us, particularly as newsroom leaders, I think there's a question of being selective and having the discipline to not reflexively do more, to decide like I'm gonna do the stuff that's exceptional, that's gonna really add value to readers and stand out in the marketplace. And readers, I would emphasize audience, very, very strongly that I'm not saying I am exceptional. I have brilliant no. te a, brilliant, no, 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 uh, a brilliant team who repeatedly say what you're suggesting Roz isn't good enough like so it, we we've created a culture where we are all willing to tell each other this idea isn't good enough or this section of a video so quite often there'll be one section which we feel is not at the standard or is not as essential as the rest of the video and even if we've spent a day working on it we've got a culture where we will just get rid of that section so it's not to say that you tell each other, oh, we're so fantastic. It's the no. reverse of that. We're constantly questioning ourselves about, is what we're doing good enough? And I realize I didn't answer your question about no, no, how this I, started. I, no, I've already figured out a way to come back to it, Go so then. don't okay. worry. <laughs> no, but that ruthlessness is important, and I say this again now with my editor hat on, is that you have to be willing to kill your darlings, and you know, if something does not meet the standard, to cut it out and come back and iterate and iterate and do it again. But I was gonna say that, you know, there's this conventional wisdom that we're delivered that content has to be snackable, that people are now consuming on their mobile phones. And so we have to, you know, you shouldn't do a video that's more, like a TikTok shouldn't be more than 59 seconds. Mm -hmm. A mobile video shouldn't be more than two, two and a half minutes, especially if people are gonna be consuming it on their phones. Um, and yet, wasn't it this happy accident of this viewer in Australia um, who got you to figure out, wait a second, people will actually watch something that's longer and something that's longer can go viral if it has substance. Right, so we'd, I, in 2019, I'd done all this work, theoretical work, endlessly writing emails and Word documents and things like that for poor colleagues who are having to listen to it. <laughs> but we hadn't actually decided to do it. I'd been talking to colleagues and editors about putting in place how we might do it, but we hadn't actually started doing it. And the bushfires in Australia, uh, the very serious ones of 2019, 2020, had begun. And at the time, I had a, we had a very talented Australian reporter and uh, producer on the program who was helping me do day after day coverage of the Australian bushfires. And one day, she had spotted that someone in Australia had filmed off the TV one of our sequences on Australia had stuck it on YouTube. It's literally, you can, it's still on YouTube. They've just filmed it with their phone. And Courtney, my colleague, said, you know, it's already on 150,000 views. And it's not only that, it was being shared. People were sending it to each other. She was getting messages from people in Australia going, hey, I know you were involved in making this. You should know it's being shared. And so we thought, okay, all right, that's, that's pretty interesting. And so Courtney and I then sat down and much more consciously started to try and implement all of the things that I'd been talking about in theory because we thought, okay, well, maybe there is something here. And it got to the extraordinary stage where we were getting messages from Australian journalists saying some of your videos are having more impact on the national discourse than some of the stuff we're doing from Australia. And that's, you know, in part a, a tribute to Courtney's brilliant production. But it was also... There was also a broader lesson, which is that people wanted detail and they wanted a different type of storytelling and they wanted a more direct type of storytelling and that this was potentially filling a gap. There wasn't anything else on the bushfires doing what we were doing. And it was at that point we thought, okay, we need to start doing this more systematically. And we did initially on the bushfires and the numbers got better and better. And it's like, okay, this is, this is definitely a thing. And then once that story uh, to some extent died down, 
we then started applying the same approach to lots of different stories, and people started to develop a relationship with it as a product. And that's when, to be a bit more practical about it, your relationships within your own newsroom become crucial because you are distributing in part via social media, but in part via your organization's digital channels. And so it was at that point that I started talking a lot to digital editors, social media editors, the people who controlled the BBC's digital output and saying, I've got a product here, I think it might work for you, how would I change it, what do you like, what do you not like, and sharing the idea and involving as many people in the idea so that it became something the BBC was enthused by and invested in rather than just something that I was making with, with a small team. And that was crucial because to be clear, without the institutional buy-in that has come from the BBC, and my editor Jess is here and many other colleagues have been very supportive, it wouldn't happen. It's, 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 a, it's a product which, for better or for worse, is associated with me because I'm the face who you see when you're watching the videos, but actually this is sitting on a large institutional operation which we built once we'd proved the idea was, so we proved the idea could work, and then once we'd got some evidence, we then started broader institutional conversation. So um, I just want to flag that since we're not going to be able to do live questioning, um, I want to give you my Twitter handle so that you can send me questions. So it's at Indira, I-N-D-I-R-A, underscore L, and use that hashtag IJF22 so that it'll be easy for me to find, and of course, you can add Roz's, um, Roz's which is BBC Roz Atkins, um, so I'll be able to take questions at the end. I want you to walk us through, Roz, the nuts and bolts of making these videos, because I think it's not, you know, you've sort of explained the concept, um, why it was necessary, you've explained how you learned that long form, longer form videos, like nine minutes, could go viral, but tell us about the actual making of the video, because I think that's important. I, what I've noticed about the form of these videos is that they're not kind of written like a college paper, or they're not written the way, frankly, that many of us do written explainers, where we have little sections and subheads, and it's like, you know, you're going point one, two, mm -hmm. three through the background and context. It's not like that. Everything sort of seems to organically, intentionally flow together, and it's hard to even pick out where the transitions are. And I wonder if that was structurally intentional from your point of view. So the, the short answer to the last bit of that question is that it definitely is, and so a more classic way of explaining a story would be to have very clear structures, and in text form you might often have subheaders which break it up. And actually initially when I was approaching this explainer product, that's how I planned to write them. Uh, and then I realized that it would be much more powerful if I focused entirely on telling a story and less on being explicit about the structure. In terms of the whole process. Well, I'll run you through, sometimes we make them on the day, sometimes we make them over two days, sometimes, for example, on the denazification uh, video we did about Ukraine, we spent three or four days, but quite often they're made on the day. So what would happen is pretty early in the morning, uh, seven, eight o'clock, we might start messaging as a team, but also with uh, Jess, my editor, who's here, but also the editor of the BBC News website as well, because they often take the videos, and we'll kick around not just a story, but what is the angle on the story? What are we doing on that story? What have we got to say about it? We're not, re we're not just producing reports. We're not just telling you this has happened and this has happened and this has happened. The whole point of the video is to say you can't understand this story without understanding this context, without understanding that these events also occurred. So we need to know what we, what we want to say. Let's assume that's settled, but that would involve quite a few messages and it would need sign off from the relevant editors before we proceeded. So we might sometimes send the editors three options, saying we're looking at these three and the editors might go, don't do those two, do this one. So we're to and fro on that. Then by nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, the producers will be in and we initially start a process which I described a little bit earlier, which, is, which is, comes in three parts. So the first one is, what do you think is the most essential information on this story? What if you didn't know this story, could you therefore not understand it? What's non-negotiable? Not what's interesting. There's infinite interesting information on any story. What's essential? 
and we don't care what form it comes in. So unlike classic TV, which is very kind of picture driven, and if you haven't got pictures, that's a big problem if you're making a TV report. We don't mind about that. We'll take information in any form. And that's the first part of the process. The second part of the process is uh, we would discuss and sometimes actually write down a list of what are the things that people are confused about, or let's not dress this up, what are the things that we're confused about? It's important to be modest in these situations and admit you just don't understand an aspect of a story. And sometimes the best explainers we've done is where we've admitted we just don't understand this and we've gone to find the answers and then we're in a better position to share. So we're looking for the essential information and we're looking to identify elements of the story we feel we have to explain or elements of the story that we don't understand ourselves and want to get help on. Through the morning, we'd essentially produce a large pile of, of elements. They could be tweets, maps, graphics, data, quotes, clips, you name it. Anything and everything, as long as it's essential. Around lunchtime, we'd then start having a conversation about, okay, well, we've got these 35 elements, how many of these really need to stay? And normally you have that conversation and maybe five or 10 or 15 of them will also be discarded, or maybe one, one does the same job as another. And we're particularly keen on this, where you use a bit of information, you use a fact or a piece of content, ask yourselves, what purpose does this serve on every single bit of information? So if I showed you a video now, and you stopped it at any point and said, what, what purpose did that bit of information serve? I would be able to answer it. So it only goes in if it's serving a purpose. Once we've gone through that process, then the producers, have, you know, the morning process is very much the producers being brilliant at what they do, and they're essentially then handing it on to me and going, here's what we think is the essential information, and then it's my job to fashion that into a story that you would want to watch. And we used to be very structured and go, right, we need to have a section on this, we need to have a section on that. And of course, there is structure to the way we produce the pieces. But increasingly, I just look at all the information and I think, okay, if I was in a, in a room like this, how would I tell you about this? And how would I make sure you didn't think I'll go for a coffee instead of <laughs> listening? And I wouldn't assume you're going to watch. So the thing about digital that is, and many of you will know this, that is brutal is if you lose people for five seconds, they're gone. TV is a much more passive way of consuming video or visual journalism, and as such, you can get away with it more in TV. If you have a lull in a TV program, people may stay with you. They might not, but they, but they may. But digital video, if you're not holding people the whole time, you're taking a huge risk, because a lot of people will just, will just go. And so for me, the challenge is, really, from the very beginning, I need to go, right, there's something going on here which is interesting. Let me take you through it. First of all, you've got to understand, and so the whole, the whole way I try to build it is I'm building a story, a narrative in front of you. And when we do it well, and I don't assume that we always do, people sometimes say, like, it was seven minutes, but it was a short seven minutes. And I think what they mean by that is that the telling of the story was sufficiently gripping even, hopefully, that you just want to know what happens next. So you're not just taking the information because it's, a, you're not just offering the information as a utility. Here, have some information. You're actually creating something that people want to watch, that people like watching. And the reason that's crucial is, if your product lives or dies by whether it's shared, people need to feel emotional about it. And when people say, hmm, that was useful, as they might do on a classic explainer, that's not normally a strong enough emotion to lead them to share it. You need people to go like, I really like this. This is really useful. And my experience is that narrative and storytelling is much, much more potent than clarity of structure. And I'm not dismissing the importance of clarity of structure. I'm just saying on its own, it's not enough to drive the level of enthusiasm that you need for your product to be shared in, in social spaces. So I've written the story. That's maybe normally by three o'clock. On every single subject we do, we always identify at least two experts on that subject in the BBC. So if it's on Brexit, it would be these correspondents. If it's on Ukraine, it would be separate correspondents. And the script goes to them. We've already approached them earlier in the day, and the script goes to them. They both then will review the script and come back with even the tiniest of corrections we'll spend ages on 
you know, really finessing the, the language and the, the information we're presenting. When they're happy, it then goes to at least one and sometimes two, depending on the nature of the story, uh, more senior editors, uh, such as Jess, who's here, they would then review it. They would also come back and say, well, it's okay, or this needs to change, or that needs to change. And only at that point, when all of those people have signed it off, would we then go onto the set and actually record it. And the reason that I've put so many checks in place, that's more, those are more checks than the standard TV piece, is that if as an impartial public service broadcaster, whose entire relationship with the audience is based on trust, is going to adapt its tone and its language to be more blunt in, in establishing what's true and what's not true. To state the obvious, you need to get that right. The jeopardy is higher. The reward is higher, but the jeopardy is higher. And so while I hope this, this product is a bold product, underneath it is extreme caution. And there have been times where we just go, we're not, we're not doing this today. We're not comfortable, even if we're 99% comfortable. Because when you step into the digital arena, you're not just stepping into a good faith arena, you're stepping into a bad faith arena as well. And you need your journalism to be ultra rock solid to, to perform in those environments. And so our confidence, if that's the right word, in the language we use and the, the, the boldness we try and use, and the personality we try and bring is underpinned by old-fashioned, very rigorous journalism. And that is no different to the same rigorous journalism that would have been done at the BBC World Service or wherever you want to highlight 50 years ago. So one technical aspect. Oh, sorry. Th so I was good. Then we record it. Oh. And then we and then we and then we clip it and then we and then we, then it gets distributed. So then, sorry, that was the last bit. <laughs> Otherwise, you've got no video. <laughs> I think we were taking that for granted, right. but thank you. Um, I think that one of the things I've noticed structurally about them is also that I, I mentioned the word transitions, that you know, many times in stories or videos, there's an obvious place where you can stop. You can just say, okay, well, I'm gonna stop watching this here, I'm gonna stop reading this here, right. I'm gonna do something else, I'll come back to it. <laughs> and what's interesting about the way you've crafted the explainers is that the transitions flow so you don't really know what's that point. When you're watching, I feel like you can't really hit the pause button because each section leads into the next, so it's sort of both narratively pushing you through, but also that's, I think, what's what keeps people engaged because you're not really, I don't wanna say you're not getting to the end of a thought, but if you know what I mean, yeah. it's like you're pushing people on to the next thought. That, so I'm glad you're saying I this. Because yeah, so this the, is in, about the this transitions. Is, thank you, this is entirely, uh, entirely deliberate. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'd observed with some of the pieces I was making back in 2017, 18, 19, was that there were stop points. Right. So I would go, right, let's look at this aspect of the story, let's look at whatever it might be, I'm going to talk about subject X, and you'd almost have a conclusion at the end of the section on X, and then you'd kind of pause, and you'd go, now we're going to look at Y. That was a break point. That was a point at which people could leave, and it didn't, make, it didn't throw you forward. So I thought, okay, well, how can, I, how can I tell this in a way that you are constantly know it being led from one aspect of the story to another? So I did lots of thinking and lots of looking at what other people were up to, to think about well, how can you do these transitions more effectively? How can where we traditionally put a stop point... So we used to put, for example, we used to put slates on these videos, breaking up the sections, and a couple of people who I really listened to said, that's doing the reverse of what you want to achieve. You're providing break points in your storytelling rather than, so you think you're doing it for clarity, but actually what you're doing is breaking up the story. Just try it without, and we tried it without, it's like, okay, this is way better. But then we pushed it even further, and um, there's a couple of techniques I use which uh, maybe it's useful to share. One is, a, um, one is what I would call looking back and looking forward. So you come off an element of the story and you want to get from that element to another element. The more classic way of coming off the first element would just simply be to come off it and immediately start talking about the next thing you're going to be doing. What I try and do, and now I say this, if you watch my videos, you'll see me doing it endlessly, <laughs> is back reference the thing that I've come off in, in the same thought as throwing ahead. So, for example, if a politician goes... I'm just making this up. If you run a clip of a politician going, and that means this whole situation is disgraceful, 
In my link off the back of that, I'll use the word disgraceful. So I will reinforce the thing that I've come off the back of. So I go, and while that politician says it's disgraceful, this is what the opposition says. So you're coming off one and reinforcing what you've heard, and in the same breath, you're connecting it to the thing that follows. And if you can get it right, and it's not that easy to get it right, but it, which, and I'm not saying that as a boast, I'm saying that as a man who rewrites my scripts <laughs> like endlessly through the day. Um, it just takes you from one thing to the next, and you're into the next thing before you even know it's happened. And the other thing I use uh, a huge amount is I begin sentences with and. <laughs> because and immediately says this adds to the thing that you've just been told. And, and, I, and I, I don't know how many sentences in a standard video begin with and, but it would be quite a few. So it's constantly saying, I'm, I've given you one thing, but I'm building up another thing, and then I'm building up another thing, and they are all connected. And if you can do that, and so one, one technique that is, I don't use every time, but that's also very uh, powerful is, is using chronolo a chronological storytelling style. And while this was happening in Washington, we heard this in London. Mm -hmm. So you're creating this sense of a story playing out in parallel, but in a connected fashion. And so these transitions or these uh, linking phrases, as I sometimes call them, where you look back and you look forward, if you can get them right, they can give your storytelling a rhythm which almost uh, takes the viewer along, just makes you think, okay, what's coming next? What's coming next? What's coming next? And one of the, one of the lessons I've you know, learned the hard way, frankly, is you can't know if it's going to work unless you say it out loud. I'm, like, I'm totally convinced about this. I've been a presenter for almost 20 years, so I'm reasonably experienced at writing scripts. You cannot know if a script is going to take the audience unless you say it out loud. And so quite often, even though we've rewritten it and rewritten it and rewritten it uh, through the day, when I get onto the set to record it, I'll do a section that I thought was just right, and it just isn't... I can feel that it's not... The flow, the rhythm of it is not correct. And... This is a very long way of saying, take those moments seriously. Those are the moments when you lose people. As journalists, we tend to be focused on the facts. Of course, we should be. We tend to be focused on being fair. Of course, we should be. We're perhaps not as obsessed about the moments we lose people in our journalism. And these moments, these transitions, these bits of the script that do not quite flow, for me, are the moments where you lose people's attention. And so your risk of losing them more completely, like they switch off or they go somewhere else, spikes. And so one of the things, the last things I do whenever we're making a video before I record it is I'll read the whole thing through, often several times, and then I'll be tinkering with tiny words here or there because I'm spotting moments of, moments of risk. And by risk, I don't mean editorial risk. I mean risk of people just switching off. Yeah, I think that really drives home the idea that it's a perfectionistic process and the sort of constant editing and rewriting and questioning yourself is incredibly important. Which is why you need a pool of people, right? Which, right. Is, you need, which is why I rest on a large pool of brilliant colleagues who can, because one person's never going to spot them, spot all the things. Right. So in the interest of looking backwards and looking forwards in the style you just told us, I want to pick up on your mentioning of this, this politician says this is disgraceful, this other politician says this. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the question of impartiality, um, a word that I no longer like to use, objectivity, because I think mm -hmm. it's really hard that anything is objective, but impartiality you can have, accuracy you must have. I would say impartiality you must have too in standard non-opinion journalism. But I've thought about this a lot in the last five years or more because of how polarized and opinionated our media environment has become. And you know, just even at this very conference in the past years, we've had talks about both sideism in mm -hmm. journalism and you know, how can you be impartial and fair and yet at the same time um, not step away from the fact so much that you're giving seeming equal weight to two sides when one side is not right. Mm -hmm. And what I found really interesting in sort of the analysis and talk about your explainers is, here, here are some of the quotes I pulled out of 
articles that have, have written about your explainers. Forensic, measured, factual, scrupulously impartial, assertive impartiality. And I noticed that in your Drinks, Nibbles, and Games Partygate video that you got uh, praise across all sides of the political aisle in Britain, which is very unusual, that you had people who are both supporters of Boris Johnson and major critics of Boris Johnson saying this is actually quite fair. And so what I want to ask you is, you know, in old time newspaper journalism, I came up in newspaper and newswire journalism, we used to always make the comment that, oh, well, if everybody is mad, then we're doing something right, you know, if we've, <laughs> if we've pissed everybody off. But in a way, you've sort of subverted this. It's like, if everybody's happy, we must be doing something right. So how, how are you letting, you know, we've always said facts have to speak for themselves. We've always said facts are foremost. But how have you created a structure in a highly polarized social media environment where you're getting people to share video that is not confirming, is not doing confirmation bias, is not confirming the left or the right, but is rather aggressively impartial? How are you getting, you know, how are you making that work in a way that doesn't fall into the both sidism? So the first thing we do is that we juxtapose any assertion with evidence. So we don't make any assertions in our videos without providing evidence at the moment the assertion is being made. So it's not like the evidence is going to come along two minutes later. The evidence is like, I will say something and here's the evidence. That doesn't give your critics much room for maneuver because you're literally saying something and here's the, here's the evidence. So if someone was going to come at you, it would be quite hard to say you were just asserting things without evidence because you have, you have provided the evidence. The second thing is, and this of course cuts to the, the core of impartiality, is that we are heavily preoccupied with fairness. And so if you take Partygate, which was essentially a series of parties in, in Downing Street during the COVID restrictions, one of our primary goals when reporting that, and we had a number of primary goals, of course, was to make sure we explained the Prime Minister and the Conservative Party's explanation for what had happened. That was one of our primary goals. And so if you watch the Partygate videos all the way through them, and we've done quite a few of them now, they are peppered with the government explaining its position. And so one of the things for me with journalism has always been, I want to understand why people do what they do and say what they say. Like I want to understand and our audience wants to understand what would the, if you're doing a video which may, uh, um, which may create questions for a politician or for a company, you want to understand what that politician or that company's response is to those criticisms or questions. That's a valid and necessary part of the storytelling. And so we are always very carefully going through, going, okay, well, this story involves these four main protagonists. Have we fairly represented all four of their perspectives on this? So that's not just putting a quote in. It's, 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 it's a slightly deeper process than that. Like, if you watch this, have you fully understood what Boris Johnson's response would be to the concerns about some of the events in Downing Street. Making sure the viewer has understood his perspective on that is a, is a priority, as much as it is for us to report on the details of the parties that took place, or whatever it might be. So that's, um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing, which is, maybe it's obvious, but it's definitely worth saying, never be snarky, or snide, or angry. Like, I really would be surprised if you could find any video I've ever done where I'm, where I'm being any of those things. I'm just giving you the best account of what's happened and the best context I can provide. And sometimes that means running a clip of a politician and coming off the clip and going, but that isn't true. So I'm being very blunt, but I'm not being angry with that politician or snarky about that politician or rude about that politician. My tone is, I hope, measured and respectful of all the people who I'm reporting on. And I think that helps because, to state the obvious, I'm not trying to score points. But if you did think maybe I was trying to score points, I would hope my tone is reassuring that I'm, I am treating all of the protagonists in the story with the same tone and the same respect. And I think that, that is very, that's helpful. 
It's interesting because, of course, uh, on social media in particular, and there are lots of news outlets that intentionally go for snark because a snark often performs very well on the internet. Um, personally, again, you know, maybe this is a legacy media thing, but at the BBC, at National Geographic, we're you know, aggressively trying to not be snarky because we want to be seen as impartial, um, you know, not taking sides, just presenting facts. And it's really, it's appealing to know that something that doesn't involve snark can also go viral. And to I that end, I also want you to tell us what does viral mean? What are the numbers? <laughs> but first answer the other question. Well, all I was going to say on the, on the, so as I've discussed, we're trying to use a tone that is more assertive than a classic manifestation of impartiality, and there brings there are risks with that because you can be assertive in a reasonable way, but there's, you could also be assertive in a way that might seem like you're angry or trying to score points. And um, you know, again, I'm referencing her a lot because uh, my editor Jess is very heavily involved in this. We will pour over single words and sentences to say not only are we meaning to be fair but is there a risk that this word could be misinterpreted as seeming angry or seeming partisan or seeming uh, snarky? So it's not even are we being that, but is there a risk that that could be interpreted? And so we're very live to the risk because we don't want to be. So like our intention is sincere. We genuinely, I've got no interest whatsoever in scoring points against anyone I'm reporting on. Um, and so the balance between being assertive so a politician says, this is true, and you go, well, we've got the data on this, and it shows that it's not. That, you can be quite blunt and quite assertive, but we've got to be very careful that it doesn't cross over into something more emotional and something more unhelpful. And again, I come back to the, the point I was making earlier, which is we're very cautious about that. So I might think the language works, but maybe a couple of other people don't, and we'll have a conversation about that. And of course, you can't reduce risk to zero, but we take care over that because, uh, not just because it matters for the reputation of the BBC, but of course it really does, but actually the success of the product rests on the fact mm -hmm. that it is not on one side or the other. So I am terrified that ever we might be misinterpreted as being on one side or the other, because the moment you, you lose your position as a fair participant in the coverage of any story, you're likely to lose a section of the audience, and I, don't, I would like everyone to be watching them, so I don't want that to happen. I want to start taking some of the really smart questions we're getting. Ezra Eman um, from Media House asks you, how do you keep the explainers digestible while increasing the information density? Which goes back to that structure question. It, it does. Ezra, thank you very much for the question. So um, uh, this is a subject I could talk about all day. <laughs> um, so. You know, the, you know the old Steve Jobs story where the, the guy brings in the iPhone and Steve Jobs goes, this is when they were coming up with the iPhone, and Steve Jobs goes, it's too heavy, and the guy who's making the iPhone goes, like, we've done everything we can, and Steve Jobs drops it in the, uh, the fish tank and loads of bubbles come out, and he goes, there's space in there, go and find it. I always feel like, <laughs> it's, the, I always feel like it's the same with scripts. You think there's no space. You think you can't make them shorter. You think you can't make them simpler. You always can. And so part of this... The process of de developing this product, and more broadly my TV show Outside Source, is, a, is about this idea of finding the space so that you can still speak with clarity and simplicity about complicated stories, but you can do it a lot, a lot more of it within a certain period of time without feeling rushed. So there's a phrase, uh, a dear colleague of mine called Alan Little, who's a BBC correspondent, he's arguably the greatest writer, journalistic writer of his generation at the BBC. He's an incredible journalist. And he talks about, um, well, I've adapted a phrase of his. I talk about obstacles to understanding. So these are things which you put into your journalism because you think they're helping, but in fact, they're doing the reverse. And I would call an obstacle to understanding something like uh, a name. So let's imagine you're doing a story about the foreign minister of a country. Maybe you don't need to say that person's name. Maybe you could put it on screen. Maybe you don't need to say the foreign minister of wherever Joe blogs. Maybe you just don't need to say Joe blogs. It says Joe blogs on the screen. If you are constantly looking for information which you've put into your journalism but is not really essential, that you could get across some other way visually or maybe you just don't need to get it across, you will create space for the things that are essential. And so, there will be 
uh, in your journalism lots of phrases that take seven words and there'll be another phrase that would do the same job which takes three. And it might seem like, oh, are you really spending all your time worrying about five words versus three? And the short answer is I am. Because if you, if you go through a, a seven minute piece and take out every time there's a phrase that you've used five words and you use two or three instead, before you know it, you've given yourself another 30, 45 seconds to put useful information into. And so that's how we do it. We're looking to create space by removing things that are not serving the purpose of the video, which is to explain. All right. Um, let's, uh, can you tell me the answer to the what defines viral and what your highest numbers have been? So our videos have done uh, pretty well. I think the biggest on Twitter is around six million. Um, we would frequently go into hundreds of thousands and pretty frequently go into the millions, which is pretty good going for news video on Twitter. Um, we do millions and millions of views on YouTube as well, and also uh, we get good figures through the BBC News website as well. They're slightly different platforms. Twitter is largely driven by search. Twitter, uh, sorry, YouTube is largely driven by search. Twitter is driven by sharing, and so as such, some videos, which are more classic explanatory, will perform very well on YouTube, while as videos which have punchier analysis and which perhaps bring more personality and more assertive impartiality uh, tend to do better on Twitter where people feel more emotional about them and are more likely to share them. Um, all I would say in terms of, uh, so there are different ways to measure the, the, the impact of journalism clearly and it's not just about numbers. So if we do, we did a video on uh, net zero the other day which was very heavily shared within the the climate community of journalists and scientists, it did pretty big numbers as well, frankly, but the fact that it was being shared in that section of, mm -hmm. of the media mattered a lot because it meant the video was reaching people who you would really want to reach. So the impact can be measured in different ways. My, I'm not, uh, I have no kind of secret message to going viral. Be, making exceptional stuff is, is obviously a, <laughs> where you have to start. The only thing I would say is, you, it, for you to generate impact on social, on a given subject, you're gonna need people who are influential on that subject to be enthused by the work that you're doing. You're unlikely to be able to do it alone. And as such, I would definitely uh, hope that we could, if we're doing a video about net zero, make sure that people within that subject area are aware that we've done a video on this. Of course, we're not expecting them to share it. We're not, you know, we, we, they're their own people. But you at least want to give your video a chance by hoping that they, they come into contact in it, with it in some form. I think without, uh, what's fascinating for me is if you look at, there's a good test that you can do. If you look at the biggest news organizations in the world, Twitter accounts, and you click on media, you can see the views that they're getting off their big accounts. If you then go and look at the accounts of some of the most high impact video journalists in the world and click on media, almost always their numbers will be bigger, even if they're part of a big news organization. And it's because in the end to go viral, individuals, part of the equation, it's not the only equation, I'm not trying to diminish the fact that I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't work for an incredible and very large uh, news organization like the BBC. But part of the equation is how you as an individual fit into the networks around the subject that you're covering. And if you are absent from the networks, uh, the information networks around the particular subject that you're covering, your chances of going viral are lower, much lower. Well, this goes to also um, building up your presence on social media, your own presence, not just your institution's presence, but your own presence, and making sure that you're connected to thinkers, um, thought leaders in those right. areas. And, and, other and, and you can't, I mean, I don't area. think, I, I think I'm absolutely certain if I was just a solo operator, I would not be sitting here That's and I right. would not be going viral. So like, the, the, That's right. the I am, you know, I am, I'm entirely reliant on the BBC in many different ways, but I do think that if you as an individual are a part of a journalistic product and you're hoping to, and part of the success of that product rests on social, that individual needs to be present and active in those areas mm -hmm. and engaging with people in those areas. You can't just lob your content in and then go for a coffee and hope it's gonna work. It's not gonna happen that way. You need to be there. 
So let's do a lightning round to okay. try to get through some of these okay. questions. Karsten Kaminsky and Monir Gadi, both of whom are from Deutsche Welle, both want to know how big your team is. And um, <laughs> it sounds like Deutsche Welle is going to give you a run for your money on this. And, um, and Karsten also wants to know, do you focus on Twitter or YouTube? It sounded from what you said earlier that you focus on both for different reasons. Uh, we focus on both for different reasons. So we have a, uh, essentially a distribution list, um, a list of places where we seek to distribute our videos. And this runs from everything from BBC Breakfast, which is a big TV program in the UK, uh, the BBC website, the BBC social channels, my social channels, um, BBC iPlayer. There's quite a long list. It's about 10 or 11 different distribution points, YouTube, Twitter, and so on. And so for different videos, we might apply different emphasis to different platforms, depending on how we think the video will, will suit the platforms. But essentially, we go for as much as we can. And most of the times, we would place our videos uh, in both. In terms of uh, staffing, well, I now have a devoted team of two producers working on these videos. So that's your answer. But in the early days, it was just my I'm not saying just about them, but we had it was we did it out of our TV resources, but the demand for the videos has increased, so we now have a devoted team. A lot of the most viral videos of the last two years have been produced by me and one person on the day. Marcus Stein, who's the head of video and TV at um, NZZ, and I'm, I'm, I apologize if I'm pronouncing this wrong, I don't speak German, but Neu Zürcher Zeitung, um, says that there have been uh, explainer videos around for a while, and where does Roz see a difference from what he and his team are producing and what Vox, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal are producing? So those three are brilliant proponents of explainer videos, and Vox in particular kind of built an entire business around explainers to their, to their great credit. Um, I wouldn't for a moment suggest I'm outgunning them in any shape or form. They're, they're all brilliant outlets. I think the, the, the difference, if there is a difference, between the explainers we're trying to make and some of the more classic explainers is that I'm only making explainers when I've got something to say. So I'm not making an explainer just saying, let me tell you what NATO is as an organization. Here's the history of NATO. Here's who's in charge of NATO at the moment. Here are his members. I, that, that's a classic explainer. I'm not making those kind of explainers. I might make an explainer saying, if you want to, want to understand what's going on in Ukraine, you need to understand why NATO is being referenced the whole time by Vladimir Putin. I might do that and have something to say about it. So I think if... Um, you know, Vox does, I don't have its data to hand, but Vox does particularly well off, off search because people, is very clever at spotting subjects people want explained. But I am, when I'm making explain, I'm making sure I've got something to say. And then the other thing I would say is that I never really called them explainers, <laughs> like, as in everyone's called them explainers, so we've kind of gone along with it. But when I, when I envisaged this, it was more like an idea of an all-in-one, like a one-stop shop on a story. And on any given story or issue, you might need different things. So my guiding principle is, what do I need to offer the audience on this particular subject? And the answer varies every single day. And then the other thing which I think is a point of difference between what we're doing and what the three media outlets you mentioned are doing. So we're doing fast turnaround depth. So Vox will arrive on a story sometimes with no news peg at all. It will just say this is an interesting issue or it might arrive on a story several weeks after the story is initially broken. The point, I'm not criticizing that by the way, but the thing that we're trying to do is the story happens and that night or certainly the next day, suddenly here's uh, the Ros Atkins Explainer team turning up with six, seven highly produced minutes. And so our ability to do fast turnaround, which connects to the fact that we are you know, I'm a TV presenter, so we have access to TV resources, which is hugely helpful. We can turn this stuff around. We're working in a newsroom that's geared to making programs every day. And that, for me, is our point of difference. And we have this, I think I was mentioning this to you yesterday, this kind of lovely thing now, which is when a big story happens, people on Twitter start going, where's the explainer from the BBC? They're looking for it, and we know they're looking for it, so we're working hard to get it to them at that point. And part of our success, like if you look at the the three Djokovic videos I did around the, the vaccine row at New Year, we got those out, we got those out within hours. And, and so there Again, was- Again, part of that depends on the size of the team. Did you, did you say the number of everyone so, on the team? So we, we now have two people who are available all, you know, who are, who are always available to work on that. So we could move 
very quickly, and it's to the BBC's credit that they've given us this resource because they know that the product success is a combination of, hopefully, good explanation and analysis, but it's also landing that depth and that detail at the moment where interest in the story is, is surging. And that's really the sweet spot, is can you do that in-depth work and deliver it at the point when the story, when interest in the story is, is peaking. And if you can, it's quite hard to do, but if you can, there's a very, uh, it's a, there's, a, there's a moment, and if you catch it, the video goes, and then you're... But that's one presenter and two producers. Yeah. That's it. That well, seems like a small team. Well, okay, but, but let's, let's, let's remember, we're also resting on a lot of BBC infrastructure, That's right? True. So okay. we've got uh, a, a brilliant set with fantastic lighting, with fantastic sound engineers and auto cue and a director and gallery staff. And there's lots of uh, TV staffing and resourcing and infrastructure right. which we lean on. So when I say there's two, of, two producers, they are working on the, the, the journalism and on the content, right. and I'm working on the script, but we are also relying on brilliant editors, brilliant experts on that subject. There's kind of, you know, we, we are a small team benefiting from a very big and impressive operation. Institution. We have two related questions here, one from Ana Paula Valaco from the Cardiff Journalism School, um, and another one from uh, Laura Doing, also from, um, from Deutsche Welle. And both of their questions center around audience, and how do you analyze the needs of the audience? And specifically, how do you use feedback from your previous videos to make the future work better? And have you gotten any unexpected or valuable lesson from audience feedback um, that would be worth sharing for newsrooms who have scarcer resources? So, let me think. So, one I've mentioned already, which is that several people came back to us and said, why are you putting these... Why are you putting these slates? Why are you putting these slides between the different sections of your video? Like, I don't like it, it's stopping me enjoying them. So like several people, independently of each other, all went, why are you doing this? And we stopped and went, why are we doing this? And then we stopped doing it. So that's, that's um, one example. Uh, another lesson, but they don't, they don't directly communicate this, is if you do too many videos, or you do videos that are just okay and not brilliant, the audience communicates with you very effectively by not watching the videos. <laughs> And you know we've had a couple of pretty brutal ones where we've just pushed out a video and the figures are just terrible. And you know that's 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 a reality. So you can tell when an audience is engaging, but also the audience quite effectively will just tell you actually I don't you know we don't want this, thank you, or this is so. Um, and in terms of um, the the other thing that that has been I guess affirming, so we haven't changed course, is that. For example, lots of schools in the UK have started showing our videos, which we didn't expect, but it's been a very nice surprise. And when I've interacted with teachers and I've gone, so six minutes too long, they're all like, it's fine. So this orthodoxy that you have to be short in order for it to work for people, I had a hunch that wasn't the case, and I had a very uh, high impact for me meeting with YouTube about five, six years ago where they just showed me data on how much people were willing to watch on single subjects and how that willingness to watch was going up and up. But you're now hearing from the audience confirming what we thought, which is far be it that the length is a problem, the length is actually a plus. They want, they want the detail. And so that's been, schools have been interesting to reassure me that, that teenagers don't necessarily want 90 seconds videos or nothing. Um, and in terms of the analytics, I, mean, I won't go into all the details here, but of the, the uh, you know, Digital's a chastening environment. If you do a TV program, you know, you can have a kind of idea of what your audience thinks. Digital is much more potent on that front because you can just get the data on where they are, who they are, how long they watch for. And the one thing we uh, are very focused on is retention rates. So on the whole, our videos have a good retention rate. So people will watch for a high percentage of the video compared with some other video. So that's a good sign but we're constantly watching that. And there have been some videos where the overall views have been good, but when we've gone into the retention rate, we've lost people. And so then you can go back and go, all right, well, a lot of them bailed out around the two or three minute mark, why? And then you can, then you can try and work out, was there a weak point there and hopefully not make the mistake again. 
So with just a couple of minutes left, I'm going to hold you to this um, lightning round concept. Oh, yeah. You okay. can only, this, okay. only short answers for these last sure. ones. Um, journalist Sabrina um, Faramarzi is asking if there are certain subjects that consistently perform better than others, politics, environment, culture. Uh, politics always performs well. Um, I know this is a really obvious thing to say, but newer stories perform better. So COVID videos perform very well, and then as the pandemic went on, performed less well. Ukraine videos performed incredibly well. They're still performing well, but they're not doing such big numbers. Partygate videos did exceptionally well. Our most recent one, I think it's on half a million, which by most measure is good, but it's nowhere near as big as previous ones. And so we normally see a trajectory where you get a spike, and then if you keep coming back to the story, it goes down. That's not to say you shouldn't do the stories, but that is definitely a pattern that, that, that the success of the videos is in part about delivering them at the moments when the interest in the story, which point I've already made, but, but that's, a, that's a trajectory which almost always plays out on a, video, on a story. Journalism Tools wants to know what your completion rate is for your explainers, and is that a measure of success for you? Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I do know that quite frequently we're above the average and it's definitely a big deal. And, it, and just like I was saying, if the completion rate's lower than we would be expecting, we would definitely look at why, because needless to say, if people aren't completing your video, that's, that's a problem. Rob Montgomery, who is a mobile journalism trainer yeah. for various media, asks how much do you and your producers write with pictures and to pictures um, when you're drafting? You kind of answered that a little bit. But so, um, is there any time when a visual was vital to understanding? Because earlier you said it doesn't so matter we just as much start for with you. What, we start with what are the things that we need to show. So if I need to show you some footage from Kiev, then the, the footage goes in. If I'm just talking about Kiev, I'm not just going to put some general pictures of Kiev. And this is a big twist on anyone who's come from a TV background. At the BBC, we call them ooves, out of visions. So these are just... And general ooves are standard in TV news. You're watching the TV, they're talking about Joe Biden, you just get some general pictures of Joe Biden. We have a complete ban on that. We only use pictures that are specific to the point that I'm making. It comes back to what I was saying earlier about if this element is not serving a direct editorial purpose, it doesn't go in. So uh, we, we write explicitly to everything, not just pictures. Uh, I hope, and you can pick me up on this, you'll never find something in our videos which is just kind of there, but I'm not talking about it. The, the reason it's there is because I am talking about it, and we're pretty hard line on that. So my last question, since we have to wrap up yeah. for this lightning round, is is there anything that you and your team cannot explain in <laughs> under 10 minutes? So, I'm, well, I'm absolutely certain there are, but uh, I'm going to be a bit more optimistic and say that there aren't, not because I think we're brilliant, but my experience of getting yourselves to a point of clarity and simplicity on a subject is that the process can always be achieved. It's just harder on some subjects than others. And it comes back to an earlier point, which is if you're struggling, and I'm struggling on almost every subject I do a video on, get help. Admit that you don't understand aspects of the story and go and find someone who can help you understand it. So I'll just finish with a 30 second story of years ago, I, went, I was sent to do an Israeli election and I didn't know very much about Israeli politics and I was sitting on the plane with a colleague who uh, did know a lot about Israeli politics and for four hours, I just asked her, but what about this and what about this and what about this? And then I would repeat back what she was saying. So if I understood it, it's this party, but it connects that. No, it's not like that. Okay, it's this. And we just went through it again and again and again. And my point is that in the end, I got to the point where I could talk simply and clearly about Israeli politics, at least for those few days. It just took absolutely ages. So I, I, I think my my optimistic advice would be you can always explain something but you've got to get help in really understanding it because if you don't really understand it you can't explain it so sometimes we jump over the understanding bit so for me a big part of these videos is being very honest with myself about the degree of my lack of knowledge and that's a good guiding principle well to me that's the beauty of your explainers our best explainers all the best explainers out there is that you make the audience feel smarter 
that they finish watching or reader, reading and they think, I'm smarter than I was five, 10 minutes ago, and now I can you know, go to work to the water cooler or go to a party and actually Hopefully. be smart. And I hope that's, that's what we're trying to do, is help people be more informed. Please join me in giving Roz Atkins a huge round of applause for pulling back the curtain and letting us see how the sausage gets made. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. It's been incredibly indulgent. I appreciate you turning out.